So I want to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to come. Uh, it's so seldom you see such a terrific turnout uh, at this kind of meeting. So it's really heartwarming to see all of you here and all of you interested in what's going on in Parkinson's disease. Uh, my topic uh, has to do with exercise in Parkinson's disease. It's one of the areas that I have become increasingly interested in, although I've been interested in it uh, for quite a long time. This is a picture of Rush. Uh, it looks pretty impressive, but I can tell you, you can't eat alligator there, so it's not all that <laughs> impressive. So anyway, let's get right into it. What my goal today is to give you the science behind the exercise. But I think it's really appropriate to start with this very old uh, quote from Plato. Lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being, while movement and methodical physical exercise save it and preserve it. I mean, he was really, uh, really a smart guy. And I mean, I think he has really summed in this sentence what we need to do, uh, not only with Parkinson's, but as individuals with or without Parkinson's. So this is usually what I get when I say, OK, you got to exercise. I hate exercise. Why do I have to exercise? Exercise is always regarded as sort of the touchy-feely kind of alternate uh, part of taking care of Parkinson's disease. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you the science behind it. Uh, not only that, but I'm hoping that by the end of this, this science and this translation into clinical practice will motivate each and every one of us in the room, with Parkinson's or without Parkinson's, to think of exercise not as something that's ancillary, but is really something that is primary to the treatment of Parkinson's disease. It is not something over here. It's something right there, right along with the Cinemet and the and the dopamine agonists and the rest of the things that we as physicians use to treat Parkinson's. What are the benefits of exercise? Well, these have been well demonstrated. So cardiovascular fitness, physical fitness, you get stronger, you get more endurance. Uh, it improves the immune system. It improves symptoms of depression and anxiety. And interestingly enough, it can also improve cognition or, or our ability to think. So when we look at this study, what we see is that with exercise, what you can see is that the hippocampus, which is our memory center, actually enlarges with exercise in contrast to people who don't exercise. I think that this is really an important finding because I think, as I'm going to point out in the next slide, we always think about exercise as being only for the body. Well, I can assure you that it goes far beyond the body and it has tremendous impact, tremendous positive effects on the brain itself. If you look beside yourself in a treadmill and you see something like this, I mean, I would be a little bit surprised. So these are my objectives. I'm going to talk about the effect of exercise in animal models of Parkinson's disease, because this is really quite compelling. I'm going to talk about the effect of exercise in Parkinson's disease people. And then finally, where, where do we go from here? What are we going to do next? So let's first start on what happens in animal models of Parkinson's uh, with exercise. So I'm going to go through a couple of studies with you. And these are the studies that I would present at a grand rounds in our neurology department. So this is a study. I'm just going to give you a couple, because I don't want to overstate it. Uh, but I just want to give you a couple. So we know that MPTP is a toxin that can cause Parkinson's. And it was initially described by Langston and colleagues when a group of young people abused this drug and all of them went on to develop what looked all the world like Parkinson's, uh, except it was caused by a specific toxin, a causative toxin. So they went, then went on and developed an animal model. Give an animal, a rodent, uh, a bit of this toxin and they will develop what looks like, as much as possible in an animal, Parkinsonism. So in this study, what they did is they had two groups. They had sedentary animals or exercise animals. And these animals exercised five days a week. They had three different groups. One were sedentary, 
without MPTP. One were exercised with MPTP, and the other were not exercised with MPTP. So they had an animal model with nothing, a Parkinsonian model without exercise, and a Parkinsonian model with exercise. And the exercise group, they, these poor little animals had to run on a treadmill 40 minutes per day, five days a week. It's really not that much. What did they find? Well, let's first look at clinically, the effects on movement. So what the idea here is this, this little guy's got to run into this box, and there's food in the box. And what they measure is the number of times the animal will slip or fall off that, that rod, or the speed with which the animal goes. And what you find is in those animals that had MPTP and exercise, they went considerably faster, actually even faster than the controls, than those that were sedentary. And in addition, the latency, so the time it took them to get there, was also, that's where the red arrows are, also reduced in those animals that exercised prior to getting the toxin MPTP. In addition then, they took a look at these animals later on, so they did sacrifice the animals to assess what's going on in the striatum. And here what you can see is that in the striatum, in these animals, so these are the sedentary with MPTP, and these are the exercised, and what you can see is that these animals who exercised were almost equal to the controls in contrast to those that were sedentary. And that's from multiple aspects of dopamine, dopamine transporters. So in fact, the exercise seemed to modify dopaminergic activity uh, in the central nervous system, in the brain. Not only that, and this is really one of the most interesting parts of it, so neurotrophic factors, BDNF, GDNF, what are they? Well, they're kind of like fertilizer, if you will. Sounds awful. But what they do is they keep cells alive. And in Parkinson's, there is a reduction in these substances which keep cells alive. So in these animals, what they did is they measured the level of these neurotrophic factors. And what you can see here is that in this exercised group, so this is exercised with MPTP, levels of BDNF and GDNF both were increased. This is really compelling because if we, this is the goal of many different projects that are going on. Can we increase neurotrophic factors? Now, most of them have relied on surgical techniques. So you have to actually trans, uh, transplant cells that do this, or you have to stimulate chemically. But here we have an example where exercise itself improve the levels of these different growth factors. Then when you take a look at these, at, at these animals pathologically, what you can see, so this is the healthy animals. This is the substantia nigra. You know that's where the dopamine cells live. And you know in Parkinson's disease, there's a loss of these dopamine cells. So here's this substantia nigra, robust, deeply pigmented. Look at these nice, healthy cells that live there. In the sedentary animals, you can see that there's pallor. You can see that you're losing that healthy looking cell. Now look at those that exercised and got MPTP. And again, you can see much more robust pigmentation as well as maintenance of these healthy cells. So here you see an animal model where both exercised helped both the movement it helped the trophic factors, and it really improved what you see underlying. And this has been shown by several investigators, Petzinger, Friedrichsen, Wang, Zygmunt, and, and it's becoming more and more of an issue for the basic scientists to try to find out why this happens. But in the MPT model of Parkinson's in rodents, it improves motor functions, increases neurotrophic factors, increases dopamine uh, availability, and finally can enhance the ability of the central nervous system to accommodate different activities, so it enhances plasticity. 
So let's go on to the second topic. What about the effect of exercise in people with Parkinson's disease? Now, of course, we're not going to put a person with Parkinson's disease in a cage and make them run after food or anything like that. And it is one of the problems that occurs when you're trying to look at people. People are so different. And some are more compliant than others. But in many of these studies, patients were highly motivated. So we ended up getting a very good look. First of all, I think it's important to point out in people with Parkinson's disease, there is a reduction by about 30% in physical activity compared to aged, healthy, matched controls. I thought this was particularly interesting. Women with Parkinson's were 80% more active than men with Parkinson's. That's if you include household activities. I won't say anything more. <laughs> and inactivity in Parkinson's is associated with worse walking, more disability, and greater disease severity. So right now, you already have a, a, a hint that activity is a good thing. So let's look at a couple of studies. This is a study I did many years ago, but this is when my interest was really inspired. This was a controlled study looking at Parkinson's people who were on medication. We randomized them into two groups. One received physical therapy, and the other just received motivation, but no specific therapy. They had an educational program and stretching in both groups. There were two four-week periods separated by six months. So these patients crossed over. The ones that got the PT first crossed over into the educational program. Likewise, educational crossed over into the physical therapy. These groups met one hour, three days a week for four weeks. We looked at the severity of Parkinson's using our classic rating scale, the UPDRS, as the primary outcome. And we followed up all of these groups uh, for at least six months. And what did we find? Well, this is a small study. At the time, there wasn't a lot of interest in physical activity, nor in exercise in Parkinson's. But what we found is in the rehabilitation group, and again, this combines the crossover periods, you could see significant improvements in motor severity, in activities of daily living as a subscale, and in the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Whereas without the rehabilitation, there was no change. NS means not significant. No change over the course of this four-week period. But the other point, and this was kind of disillusioning, after six months, most became sedentary and then showed no difference from baseline. So what this means is once you start doing it, you have to continue to do it. You can't just stop. So regular exercise improves movement, improves activity of daily living, but it will wane if you don't do it. Now this was a very famous study. It came out, I mean, it was on a lot of different news shows. Uh, this is Albert's study. It was done at the Cleveland Clinic. Small number of people. But what he looked at was forced exercise versus voluntary exercise using bicycling. So what people had to do, they had three one-hour sessions per week over eight weeks. The forced was a tandem bike. So you had the trainer on the front and the person on the back, and the trainer would make the person pedal at a rate of 80 to 90 RPMs. In the voluntary, they could pedal at whatever speed they chose. So they were exercising, but they really weren't doing it at the intensity. And what did he find in this small group? Well, this is baseline, so everybody was the same. And again, using our Parkinson's rating scale, at the end of training, those with forced exercise did better, and you can see that by the downward slope of that, than those who just pedaled along whatever speed they wanted to. One month after stopping, again, you can see this waning of effect. So again, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. So the limitations, a small number of patients, it wasn't really blinded as to treatment, and the trainer may have been the motivating factor. So that's why it wasn't blinded. Now he is doing a large study that's currently underway. It's on clinicaltrials.gov, um, and hopefully we'll have a better 
a better picture of what this can do for people. This is study three. This was another famous study, came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. Randomized controlled trial, that's what we always like to hear because that develops the highest class of evidence. Um, it was people with Parkinson's and there were three groups, 65, this is a fairly large number, did Tai Chi, 65 resistance, and 65 only did stretching. This was a 60 minute class, two times a week for 24 weeks. And the outcomes were measured at three, six months, and then three months following completion. And what they found is that in the group that did Tai Chi, there was a reduction of five to seven points in the UPDRS, so a clinically significant improvement in Parkinson's symptoms. And this was found in both Tai Chi and resistance, not in the stretching group. However, for falls, look at this. So over the course of time, 39% of the people would have a fall. But the Tai Chi group had 67% fewer falls than did the stretching group. Three months after the intervention, the benefits persisted. But one wonders if one stops it at six months, would we be, would we be back to baseline? And finally, this is a study that looked at comparisons of different kinds of exercise. What should people do? I get this question all the time. What, should, what am I supposed to do? So this study looked at a non-progressive form of exercise, which means stretching, but no progression insofar as strengthening, versus progressive resistance exercise, where you increase the weights as you go, as you can tolerate it. This was a two-year study. Um, and they did this twice per week. They did have a personal trainer that maintained throughout, but at a less frequent interval. And they were tested every six months up to two years. And they were measured off their Parkinson medicines, meaning first thing in the morning without any effect of, of, of medication. This just shows the two exercise programs. We did the fitness counts for the stretching and the non-progressive. For the progressive, we had really aggressive physical trainers, personal trainers, that would take people to the next level. Not really no pain, no gain. We didn't want people to be in pain, because that's a bad thing, but to test the limits of what they could do and to maintain them at that level and then progress it. And what we found, so this is in the fitness counts group. This is the, again, the measure, UPDRS measure, where down is good. And you can see in the fitness counts at six months, these people got better. But then they started to drift back despite continuing, so they weren't doing a progressive exercise. I think it shows that any activity is better than none. But in the uh, progressive resistance, what did we see? Well, we saw the same downward slope, but it was maintained. So people continue to do better with progressive resistance exercise as long as it was continuing. And this was despite the fact that there was no really significant change in their anti-Parkinson medication in either group. They started lower, but you can see that there was a little bit of an increase, but not a dramatic increase in medication. So I think that what that tells us is that we do know that you have to do a little bit more than just stretch. Uh, progressive is probably better than non-progressive. And forced exercise, God help us, may be better uh, than just doing it at your own rate. So where do we go from here? So now we're doing a study that's going to look at exercise in people who are not on treatment. Treatment is a confounder. Because when you take a medication, you do better. So sometimes that confuses the outcome. So these are people not on treatment, recently diagnosed, multi-center, it's called the SPARKS trial, which I really do like. And the questions are, can untreated people with Parkinson's exercise at a high intensity? Can they do this consistently? What dose is superior? Should you be medium intensity or should you be high intensity? And finally, and I think this is an important issue, are there any side effects? Keep in mind before you start on an exercise program, you have to check with your internist. You want to make sure that you are fit to be able to participate in an exercise so it's safe. You want to be safe. So this just shows we're going to have 200 patients. We're about a third through our recruitment. We're going to put them in a wait list, which means they 
just get usual medical care. We're going to put them in a high intensity, 80 to 85 percent of their heart rate, and then we're going to put them in a medium intensity. And we're going to see what difference it makes. Um, there's going to be a six-month blinded assessment, and then the waitlisted group, we don't want you to think that we don't think exercise is good, will then be able to participate for free in this exercise program. This is funded by the NIH, so everything is provided at no cost to patients and at no cost to their insurance companies. In addition, we want to find out, are there any AEs? Are there any adverse effects? So the SPARC study itself, it's treadmill four times per week for four weeks at a training center, so it's rather vigorous. Um, you can continue near your home, and it's monitored by heart monitors. So if someone's not getting up to their 80%, you're going to be able to see it. So we're going to be able to measure compliance. And the questions that we hope to our address, can they do it at the different levels of intensity? Is it an effective treatment for Parkinson's? And finally, what we're leading up to is, is there a way, is there a signal in this that exercise may actually protect against progression of disease? So it's an exciting study, but one that's going to have to wait for a while before we understand it. So in summary, the research shows benefits in animal models, improved symptoms of Parkinson's, and here's the may slow. Of course, I want to make, put a big caveat. We haven't shown that, but that's my sense. And so a lot of research is yet to be done. But while this research is going on, don't miss the boat. So what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of advice about exercise. Okay. So what is exercise? When I talk to patients, they say, yes, I exercise. Then I say, well, what do you do? And how long? And how many days a week? Because that's really the telling story. So this is a gentleman who walks his dog five times a week. Is he exercising? Exercise is physical activity, structural and repetitive, with the goal of maintaining and improving fitness and function or health. If you don't get a little shorter breath, if you don't break a sweat, you're probably not really exercising. Doing laundry doesn't count. I wish it did too. So how much activity do adults need? This is the CDC recommendations, so the Center of Disease Control recommendations in 2008. This is what I tell my patients to do. So per week, 30 minutes, five days a week of moderate aerobic activity after you check with your doctor, your internist. So that means you get a little shorter breath, okay? You can't sing happy birthday all the way through. And you may break a sweat depending on what the temperature is. And then you do some muscle strengthening, some weight lifting. It doesn't have to be 100 pounds, but some mild weight lifting twice a week. Vigorous activity, if you really wanna do it, you can't even sing the first happy birthday without getting breathless. Uh, and muscle strengthening two days. Maximal activity, of course, you double your activity time. But you can do it 10 minutes at a time. You don't have to do the whole thing at one time. So you can do it in little fragments. What kind of exercise? We don't know yet. Treadmill looks good, walking, jogging, weights, tai chi, yoga, zumba, brisk dog walk. Not the guy who's sitting in the chair, but a brisk dog walk. Good for the dog, good for you. This is what most people do. They go out, they buy their treadmill. You take it from there. This is what we don't want to see. What do we hear when we tell people to exercise? Well, it's too hot, it's too cold, I don't have time, my knees hurt, it makes me tired, I don't like to sweat, I will start tomorrow. And then tomorrow, of course, never comes. So the take home point, exercise can optimize Parkinson treatment, a little goes a long way. You know, if you think about it, 30 minutes out of your day isn't very long. Do exercise that you like. If you absolutely hate what you're doing or it hurts, do something else. And schedule it into your day. Don't just say, I'm going to do this afternoon sometime. Morning is best, say from 8.30 to 9.15, that's what I'm doing. And you can't do anything else, okay? No excuses. This is our, I want to thank the people that funded the research that we've been able to do in collaboration mostly with the University of Illinois and Daniel Corcus. And last but not least, I want to urge you all, just like this little cat, uh, to develop regular exercise programs. Thank you. <laughs>